Listening. IELTS practice. Questions 1 to 5. You will hear a telephone conversation about voluntary work. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hello, volunteers worldwide. How can I help you? Hello. I'm ringing to find out about opportunities for doing volunteer work. Could you give me some information, please? Yes, certainly. But before I do, I need to ask you for a few personal details. That's just because the opportunities open to you are dependent on your age and on what qualifications and skills you have. That's fine. So... If you could just start by telling me your name and age. OK. My name's Ben Opperman, and I'm 22 years old. OK. And what qualifications do you have, Ben? I've got a BA degree in Social Studies. That was from the University of Kent. And I'm a qualified teacher. I've just completed my PGCE, my postgraduate certificate in primary education. And you're interested in doing unpaid voluntary work rather than a full-time job with our organisation? Yes, that's right. I'd like to do voluntary work before I start looking for a more permanent job. How long were you hoping to work for us for? I was thinking of two years at most. OK. Well, for people in your age group, we have two programmes. Global Youth Contact and Youth for Action on Development. GYC, Global Youth Contact, is a six-month exchange programme which provides opportunities for young people from different countries to work together in local communities. I see. But that's only a six-month programme. That's right. But our other programme, Youth for Action on Development, requires people to volunteer for a year at least. On this programme, most of the placements are for 12 or 18 months. Ah, that'd be the programme I'd go for. OK. Now, do you have any other skills or special interests that might be useful for the kind of work we do? Well, I've done a lot of conservation work in the area where I live. Good. That's useful to know. And I belong to a wildlife protection group. Right. That could be very helpful. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Do you have any questions you'd like to ask me? Yes. Could you tell me what sort of placements are available? Well, all our placements are related to the four main areas that we work in. That's education, health, social participation and employment. Education sounds like the obvious choice for me. And if I wanted to go ahead and apply to work on a programme like this, what do I have to do? OK. Well, our selection procedure is quite a lengthy process, I'm afraid. It can take up to nine months. We get many more applicants than we have placements for, so we need to make sure that we get the best people for the kind of work we do. It's very important to realise that voluntary work like this is not an easy option. Although you'll have a brilliant experience with us, you are expected to work hard and make a real contribution. It is not just sitting around enjoying a different culture. <laughs> of course, I understand that. OK. So, if you're interested, I can send you an application pack. You complete the forms and send them back to us. If you are shortlisted, we invite you to come for an interview. That's normally in January. Assuming you're successful, we then start looking for a suitable placement. While we're doing this, we ask you to raise some funds of your own so that you end up contributing about two-thirds of the cost of your training and travel. OK, fair enough. 
I suppose people get sponsorship, do they? Yes, lots of volunteers do that. Then in June, we ask you to come to our headquarters for a week's training. This starts with general training, which is applicable to all volunteers. It includes topics like how to fit into new cultures, looking after yourself mentally and physically, and how to go about relating to the kinds of people you'll be working with. And then you'll have sessions related specifically to your placement. We'll tell you about the country and the area you'll be going to, about the problems and difficulties to expect, and about the kind of responsibilities you'll have once you're there. And when does the work start? It depends. But generally speaking, placements start in September and run for up to 18 months. Sounds brilliant. Could you send me an application pack, please? Yes, certainly. If you'd like to give me your address. OK. It's 29 Park Street. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. Tom and Barbara are talking about markets in London. Barbara has a market list, and she wants to find out more details about them. Listen to the conversation and complete the market list. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Hi, Barbara. What will you do this weekend? Well, I'd like to do some shopping, but I have no idea where to go. I've only been here a few days. I was told London is an expensive place to live. Yes, but that's not completely true. London can be an expensive place to live, but if you shop in the right places, you can live relatively cheaply. Is that true? Could you tell me something about the shops? All right. You know, food tends to be cheapest in the big supermarkets, like Sainsbury's and Tesco's. Most of them have quite a good variety of food and household items. You can buy your fruit and vegetables on the street. You will find these street markets in almost every part of London. You can also buy clothes, shoes, and household items in these markets for a real bargain. Have you got a market list provided by the Student Union? Yes, here you are. This might give you some ideas. Let me see. E Street, SE 17. This market sells cheap food, clothes and hardware. It's open from 8am to 5pm. Yes, but how can I get there? You can take the underground. We call it the Tube. You see, there is a Tube station on the list. Let me see. Yes, it's Castle Station. Right. You can get off at the castle. Good. Look at Leather Lane, WC1. Yes, that's a good central London market for clothes, food and hardware. It opens at lunchtimes from Monday to Friday. It's near Chancery Lane Station. Well, what about the one in Petticoat Lane? Oh, Petticoat Lane E1. It sells clothes shoes and household goods. It opens only on Sunday mornings from 9am to 12 noon. Yes, we can get off at Oldgate Station. OK, what about the one in Walthamstow, E17? Oh, that's a big market for clothes and food. It, it's open between 9am to 4pm on Mondays to Saturdays, except Wednesdays and Sundays. 
Let me see. Yes, we can get there on the central line. What about Brixton? That's Brixton SW9. It's an indoor and outdoor market with a lively atmosphere. It sells vegetables from all over the world. It opens 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Mondays to Sundays and half days on Wednesdays. Oh, it's close to Brixton Station, very near my place. Great, it's very convenient. Tell me more detail about Camden Lock. Yes, there are several markets on Camden High Street, and plenty of shops. They sell fashion clothes, jewelry, recorders, and pottery. It's good for buying presents. Very close to Chalk Farm and Camden Town Station. I see. It says that it opens on Sundays only, from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Well, I think these markets might help to keep my costs down. Well, if you need to buy new electrical goods or large household items, you can wait until the January sales, when almost all the shops sell goods at discount prices. Thank you very much for your help, Tom. Shall we go to Brixton together this weekend? I'd love to. Oh, I'm afraid I've got to go to a lecture. I will ring you tonight. Bye. Okay. Bye. Barbara is phoning Tom about shopping. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions eighteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions eighteen to twenty. Four oh one, oh six two five. Hello, is that you, Tom? Hi, Barbara. Have you decided where to go tomorrow? Yes, that's right. I want to go to Camden Town to shop. Would you like to go there with me? Yes, I'd love to. That's a good market. Mary's here with me now. She wants to go there too. Shall we meet at Camden Town Station? Okay. How are you going there? We will go there by bus. It's only three stops from my place. Well, we might walk there if the weather is fine. How will you get there? I think I will have to take the underground. I'm at Bond Street, and I'll take the Central Line first and get off at Tottenham Court Road. That's it. Take the Central Line and get off at Tottenham Court Road. Then you want the Northern Line to Camden Town. It's only about four stops. Make sure you get a northbound train, though. You want northbound Camden Town, okay? Okay, I think I can find the way. I have an underground map with me now. What time shall we meet there tomorrow? How about ten thirty? Well, I think that's a bit too late. It might be crowded by that time. How about one hour earlier? Say nine thirty. Fine, that will be all right. See you tomorrow. Bye. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two teachers talking about the work experience program for their students. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Okay, we've got to arrange this program. Work experience. I believe quite strongly in this myself. 
Studies are often just too theoretical, and the best learning can be on site. Sure, in principle, but you've got to find the right companies. For business students, it's so easy with all the commercial enterprises around here. But for our lot of engineering students, it's not so easy at all. Last year's education students were easy too. We just put them all into schools. Well, there are a few companies that will accept our students. Building sites are the main avenue to explore, but the trouble is that not many of these places want inexperienced learners around. Why not? Last year when I did this, I think these companies were worried about accidents. Now it's more a time issue. They just don't want to train people. But these people work for free. But training takes time, and in the economic recession, few companies want their personnel diverted for such purposes. But I did find some companies, enough for us at least. But they all insist on one thing: minimum work time of one month, right? No, that the students are appropriately insured. Remember, these are building sites, and there are quite a few hazards there. And we're putting untrained students, not trained students, right amongst them. So these companies want financial coverage in case of accidents. Gee, is that going to be expensive? Yes, I'm afraid so. Since we live in quite a litigious society, consequently insurance rates are sky high, almost unaffordable. I see. Can our budget meet this? Last year we couldn't pay for the program. This year we can, since we have fewer students to deal with, but we'll nevertheless have to cut corners in certain areas. Hmm. I never like it when that happens. Neither do I. In which areas do we need to economise? Well, the payment to students is not going to change. After all, they won't do this work unless they can get some money. We'll also continue to subsidise their travel as we did last year. Last year we gave them a completion bonus too. It was a big success. Made them go through the whole month. But not this year. We'll impress upon the students that possible failure could result if they don't finish the whole term. Okay, I trust that will work. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. The most important issue for me about this work experience program is which companies are getting involved, and that was your job. What companies did you find? Right, four companies are prepared to help out: Heppelwhite Distilleries, AJ and Sons Engineering, Johnson Demolition, and Sansoni Security. How many students can they take? Heppelwhite can take five, no six. Six. Sorry, sorry, five. It's limited at the moment by the winter, since beer drinking is lower around this time. As for AJ and Sons, that would be seven. Last year it was seventeen. Not this year, I'm afraid. Ah,、uh, the other two places are six and six, which makes up everyone twenty-four of them. Right. What about starting dates? Ah,、uh, that's the problem. They cannot all start and finish on the same date, which makes this a little hard to dovetail with the academic semester. Heppelwhite can accept its cohort around August fifteenth. AJ are a little later, starting five days later, in fact. The twentieth. Actually, the twenty-first is what they said. And the other two? The demolition company can start earlier. The start of the month, the first, and the security firm will start three days later on the fourth. Okay, that sounds good. And will all our students work for one month? Well, remember, it doesn't have to be a full month, but just long enough to meet syllabus requirements. So, how long is Heppelwhite going to use these students? They said three weeks, maybe four weeks, if we want it. We want it. Tell them the longer option is necessary. Sure, sure. I think they'll accept that. The students will probably buy some of their product, which will make the owners happy. 
Ah, as for the engineering company, it's giving twenty-four days. That's fine. And the demolition company? Ah,、uh, they're saying two weeks, fourteen days. Impossible. The students can't complete their projects in such a short time. You'll have to be stronger. Tell them minimum eighteen days. All right. The owner seems reasonable. He'll probably accommodate us if I throw in a few incentives. That leaves the security company, which is offering. Let me guess. Uh, three weeks, twenty-one days. Almost twenty-two. Ha! I was close with my guess of twenty-one. Just one day off. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture about philosophy. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Most of you, I hope,、uh, will be familiar with the name Socrates. The ancient Greek philosopher is perhaps one of the most admired people in history. Socrates led a very noble life. He was, I suppose, you could say, an optimist, who believed in the good of mankind. According to Socrates, human nature leads people to act correctly and in agreement with knowledge. Socrates believed that evil and wrong actions arise out of ignorance, and is famously quoted as saying, "No man knowingly does evil." But true to his personal beliefs, Socrates devoted his own life to seeking goodness and truth. Born in Athens, where he lived all his life, Socrates always dressed simply, and was known for moderation in both eating and drinking. He brought his teachings to the masses, speaking regularly in public places such as the busy streets of Athens, especially in the area around its great market place. He had little regard for public opinion. And always conducted himself in accordance with his own set of rules. Socrates built up a reasonably large following of Athenians, looking to learn from his seemingly endless wisdom. But he also had a good many enemies who mistrusted him on account of his unorthodox views on subjects such as religion. Socrates' enemies were what you would call. The wrong type of enemy, being powerful and influential Athenians, their efforts to have him ruined、uh, saw him brought to trial on charges of corrupting the young and disrespecting religious traditions. In the trial, Socrates defended himself, claiming that he had done nothing more sinister than enlighten people. With a clearer knowledge of the truth, which is essential for the correct conduct of life, 
he made some remarks aimed at the ruling establishment, uh, suggesting that those who are elected are not necessarily fit to govern effectively. Socrates himself had long ago become disenchanted with the materialistic ways of the upper class. Unfortunately, his views were seen as an attack on democracy and the electoral process, so the jury found Socrates guilty as charged and sentenced him to death. It is thought that many members of the jury resented his unbending pride and that this may explain the harshness of the punishment handed down to him. Despite being given several opportunities to escape prison, Socrates resisted and carried out his sentence calmly by drinking a cup of hemlock poison. During his life, Socrates introduced the idea that there are a set of universal standards by which people should be judged. His method, known as the Socratic method, involved discussion between two or more people around some key term. In theory, those party to the discussion should all define the term in the same manner. However, his studies found that this was seldom the case. Socrates encouraged his followers to engage in such discussions with the goal of trying to proceed from less adequate definitions to more accurate definitions over time the ultimate goal being a true and universal definition that could not be contradicted by anyone. This method tended to expose the ignorance of the Athenians of his day. It showed that many things that they assumed true were in fact false. Socrates also used irony to expose people's ignorance of key concepts. That is, he claimed to differ from others in recognizing that he himself was ignorant. His insistence on ignorance reminded other people of their own ignorance, but won him few friends in high places. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.